Benjamin Franklin is one of America's most beloved founding fathers. Unlike John Adams, who is notoriously priggish, or George Washington, who is often portrayed as a god among men, Franklin is relatable. He is one of 17 children born into a middle-class family in Boston. He never attended a fancy institution like Harvard, which he attacked for only accepting rich kids and teaching them how to be arrogant. And at 17, he ran away from his home in Boston and set sail for Philadelphia with almost nothing to his name. Yet, despite this humble start, Franklin went on to become a prolific writer, inventor, diplomat, and patriot. He invented bifocals, helped edit the Declaration of Independence, and secured an alliance with France without which America might well have lost the revolution. He is a perfect example of Sir Francis Drake's motto, Sic Parvis Magna, greatness from small beginnings. Now, Franklin's writings are a gold mine for rules on how to live your life, especially poor Richard's almanac. Some of my favorites are search others for their virtues, thyself for thy vices, haste makes waste, make haste slowly, and there are more old drunkards than old doctors. However, some of Franklin's maxims for living the good life were not intended to be taken seriously and others that were, he did not follow himself. So rather than look at Franklin's words, this video is going to look at Franklin's actions and tease out some of the general principles that can be applied to anyone's daily life. Most Americans see the name Benjamin Franklin as being synonymous with patriotism, and not a patriot in the modern jingoistic sense, people like myself who occasionally shed a tear during the national anthem, but a patriot in the powerful, revolutionary sense, a person willing to sacrifice their life, fortune, and sacred honor for a cause that they believe in. What many people don't realize is that Franklin was a staunch loyalist, far beyond many of his American contemporaries. In the 1750s, he was sent to England to lobby on behalf of Pennsylvania, and he quickly fell in love with the city of London. There was a time when he hoped he would never have to return to the colonies, which he derided as lacking virtue and decency. In 1765, when the Stamp Act passed, Franklin appointed John Hughes to enforce it and advised him that firm loyalty to the crown will always be the wisest course. That was followed by a mob of angry colonists marching to Franklin's home. Then, nearly a decade later in 1773, Franklin declared the Boston Tea Party an act of violent injustice. He even offered to pay for the lost tea out of his own pocket. He dreamt of a united empire between England and America, and he fought to keep that dream alive for years. Even in his later years, he argued that if Parliament had implemented his plan of union, the entire revolution could have been avoided. It wasn't until one year before the Declaration of Independence was signed that Benjamin Franklin switched sides and did so viciously. In 1775, he wrote a letter to his friend saying, Mr. Strahan, you are a member of parliament and one of that majority which has doomed my country to destruction. You have begun to burn our towns and murder our people. Look upon your hands. They are stained with the blood of your relations. You and I were long friends. You are now my enemy, and I am yours." Now, Franklin leaked this letter partly to dispel some of the accusations that he was a secret loyalist saboteur, but Franklin did go on to become one of the most important figures in the Patriot cause. This is a radical departure from the Franklin we knew in the 1750s, who adored his mother country, who wanted nothing more than to see her succeed. He flipped from being a loyal Tory to a treasonous rebel. And it was this willingness by Franklin to give up antiquated ideas, to change his mind as facts and circumstances changed, that helped shape the America that we know today. Frugality was a big, big deal for Benjamin Franklin. It was one of the few things he genuinely appreciated about his wife, Deborah, her frugality and industry. Once he wrote her a poem that read, not a word of her shape or her face or her eyes. 
of flames or of darts shall you hear. Though I beauty admire, tis virtue I prize, which fades not in 70 years. But when I say pay your debts, I don't just mean your literal, physical debts. What makes Franklin unique is that he also took into account his moral debts. Throughout his entire life, Franklin kept a ledger detailing the mistakes he had made on one side and how he made amends for those mistakes on the other. Franklin listed running away from his brother as one of the first errata, or sins, of my life. Years later, when his brother James fell ill and died, Franklin took it upon himself to care for James's son and concluded in his autobiography, thus it was that I made my brother ample amends for the service I had deprived him of by leaving him so early. It is incredible the way Franklin handled the sins in his life. Rather than burying them in the past as some people do, or carrying around a tremendous amount of guilt, Franklin turned his sins into mathematical equations that simply needed to be balanced by doing the appropriate amount of good. The philosophy of Stoicism was a big deal in Franklin's time. George Washington even had the Stoic play Cato performed for his soldiers at Valley Forge. And one important aspect of Stoicism is this idea of practicing poverty as a kind of mental preparation for hardship. Now Franklin used the same strategy to help guide his decision making. Early on in his printing career, someone offered him a good amount of money to publish an article which Franklin said was scurrilous and defamatory. In his autobiography, he wrote, Determined whether I should publish it or not, I went home in the evening, purchased a two-penny loaf at the baker's, and with the water from the pump made my supper. I then wrapped myself up in a great coat and laid down on the floor and slept till morning, when, on another loaf and another mug of water, I made breakfast. From this regimen, I feel no inconvenience whatsoever. Finding I can live in this manner, I have formed a determination never to prostitute my press for the purposes of corruption and abuse of this kind for sake of gaining a more comfortable subsistence. In other words, Franklin tested what his life would be like without much money and realized he could be just as happy as he is now. Today, it's easy for people to assume that they need certain luxuries. And if we were to instead practice life without those luxuries, I think we'd often find that we don't need them to be happy. Okay friends, this concludes part one of a three-part series on Benjamin Franklin. As always, please let me know what you thought in the comments below. Um, if you like this video, feel free to click them fancy share buttons down there. I do appreciate it. Um, and part two and part three of this video series will roll out over the next couple weeks, or they may already be out, in which case you can click some of those links over there. Um, and yeah, that's all for me. Um, today, I'm gonna leave you guys with a question, and that is what debts do you still need to repay?